being productive when you have the opportunity to be is absolutely massive and I am a bit of an evangelist when it comes to trying to manage my screen time and be conscious when I'm using my phone. It's a big thing like it's really easy to get stuck on the Instagram reel or the TikTok but when I look to use my phone using it in a in a meaningful way to consume content that's really going to benefit me making sure that when I am using my devices that I'm getting some sort of bang for my buck and re- and like a positive feedback loop on what, I, what I'm doing making sure that I'm very intentional with my time. I don't like to be on autopilot and doing things that are kind of dictated to so for example controversially I won't watch Love Island because I know that I probably want to watch all of it an an hour a night every single week or an hour on catch up all the time would I get an awful lot from that no so I'm probably more likely to spend an hour researching a podcast guest or listening to a podcast about an area of my life I want to improve on so being quite intentional with how I spend my time enables me to have greater freedom when it comes to the weekend and a month Cool. Good evening. How are we? Good evening, Fergus. Yeah, really good. Looking forward to this one. Very much so. Very much so. And we are we are somewhat local. I mean, you are you are in the west. I'm in the east. You sound like you're from the west. I sound like I'm from the north of England. So there's a there's a bit of a discrepancy there. But why don't you kick things off by telling us who you are and what you do? Yes, Fergus. So yeah, like you said, uh, based in the west of Scotland, a place called Bears Den, just outside Glasgow. Grew up here. Uh, I am now the grand old age of 29, which feels a bit frightening to tell people because I think you become increasingly aware of your mortality the closer to 30 that you get. Again, somebody who's 39 will be shaking their head at me saying the closer you get to 40, the more that's the case. But for me, I certainly became a bit more aware of that this year. I, and probably the main reason that we're having this conversation is that I live a bit of a, a dual life in terms of I work full time in a business development career, specifically in the design-led furniture industry, supplying into student accommodation. And my kind of second life is creating content on Instagram and with my podcast, Camro Conversations, often pretty much stemming off the back of my big interest in fitness and self-development. So I live that kind of dual life. I balance both. I spin those two plates majorly while, of course, trying to get in pretty ruthless physical shape as well. And right now, I can confirm you are in pretty ruthless physical shape, and and that that's come at some cost, hasn't it? So, <clears throat> why don't you talk us through the the experience you've just been through? Because you've gone through quite a long dieting phase, haven't you, to get to the stage that you're in, and that is alongside a demanding job, lots of travel, lots of nutritional demands. And I think that the real aim of this conversation for me and for people listening, I think, is to to understand the strategies that you've implemented to really spin both of these plates that people so often find difficult to spin simultaneously yeah that, that that's it ferguson i think when it comes to like career and fitness and things like that you have to actually care about what you're doing because i've met loads of people who maybe work a really menial job that they really don't really like and they're just are super passionate about fitness and they're all there's always that kind of thing in the back of the head about maybe i'll be a pt maybe i'll go and coach and they kind of just coast through their career, whereas I'm very, very passionate about trying to get to peak performance within my career and grow in that space, while, of course, doing the fitness stuff on the side. And I think if one was to be like more important than the other, it would kind of feel a bit of a out of whack for me because it's always been that way. Equally, there's times when like I have to prioritise elements of my fitness. Like you were saying there, I've just come off the back of a, a photo shoot that I did about three weeks ago now, and that was a... Was a program that my friend's coaching company mtn runs it's called the 12 week peak and it's quite a an extreme program there's like 300 people do it and we all do a photo shoot at the end of the 12 weeks where you're you're in your pants in front of the camera as exposed as you possibly can be now i've been lifting weights for like 13 14 years like you i think i got into it through through rugby and strength conditioning and i've dieted lots of times over that period so i am quite used to getting very lean but when you're going to be in front of a camera, there's a little bit of pressure and expectation on you as one of the more experienced people doing that program to bring a good level. And obviously, I've told Instagram, I've, I've publicly said, I'm going to bring my best, I'm going to look fantastic, I'm going to push myself. There's a little bit of expectation, but sometimes that pressure can be a can be a good thing. So during that period, there was a big focus on just being that little bit more aggressive with my daily habits and upping some of the things that I've done in terms of intensity so I'm a super active person already in terms of training five six days a week with weights walking 10 to 12,000 steps but when you're trying to get photo shoot lean and get as shredded as you can some of that just becomes a little bit more extreme and the steps go up the calories come down the 
prioritization of your training over other areas of your life starts to come in as well because if I want to go in and maintain my muscle mass and do the same on the leg press or the squat or the bench press or the barbell row as I did last week, other variables in life need to be absolutely on the money. Otherwise, I'm going to be dragging myself through my work day performing poorly. I'm going to drag myself through my training session and I'm not going to bring my best self to these two critical areas of my life. I can completely understand from from a from a personal point of view if, if one thing falls apart when you're in those those high stress, high demand situations training wise, everything else can quickly fall apart. But what is it about getting lean? What is it about that specific side of fitness that you are drawn to? Is it the control? Is it the the aesthetic side of things? Do you just feel a better version of yourself for looking the way that you do? Is it the process? Because it's something from a personal point of view I did want decided I didn't really enjoy and I now am very very much performance oriented and whatever body composition goals come out the other end it's a bonus occasionally I'll think oh, I'd rather be a bit leaner but then I feel the effects of being in a sustained calorie deficit and think you know what no this isn't for me so what is it what is it that draws you to it cosmically Underst- yeah understanding your why is vital because like you said there you you brought that really diced up lean physique and you hold a you hold a good level year round but you kind of pushed it to the extremes once and you're like, okay, that was fun. But for me, it's about the kind of crazy challenges that you undertake, the pushing your body to the physical limits when it comes to actual performance. For me, I've always been massively attracted to the aesthetic side of things in terms of like, can I look physically impressive? Of course, with that comes some physically impressive feats in terms of what you're able to lift and what you're able to do. But actually, I'd much rather look like I could squat 200 kilos than ever want to actually squat 200 kilos not that my legs look like I squat 200 kilos Fergus but they can they, they, they're, they're, they're a decent size and shape depends um, who you're talking to perception is everything <laughs> that's true so I, I was always drawn to the aesthetic side of things when I started playing rugby I was I've never I was never like a big guy as a kid and I'm not a big guy now but I am muscular and my physique's very much up there in terms of the condition and proportion of it um, compared to the general population and I always thought that was something that I wanted and i just you mentioned the c word control i have a personality that definitely enjoys elements of like controlling what i put in and getting the positive feedback loop of what i get back out so the process of like controlling what you can is fantastic and we were speaking recently actually about golf and that's one of the areas in my life where the effort that i put in i sometimes don't feel that it's always rewarded so like if i'm practicing really hard twice a week and i play on a saturday and I don't have a better score than I did the week before. I'm like, oh, well, that was difficult because there's so many variables that can go wrong. Whereas with improving your physique from a, a muscle perspective or from a from a condition and a fat loss perspective, pretty much what you do is pretty much what you get out of it. Obviously, there's genetic limitations in terms of how you're going to look in terms of like, are my abs going to be symmetrical when I get that lean? Are my are my calf insertions rubbish, which mine are? But these these are all things that I have a lot more control over so if I hit my calories this week if I hit my steps if I hit my sleep if I train hard the 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 feedback loop and the output is so easy to measure and it comes out pretty much as you would expect I guess you probably get some of that with your performance but there's probably more variables like when you did the Keltman for example I think the conditions meant that all the training all the effort you put in before it it would be capped at some particular level just based on what's going on outside correct but I think <clears throat> excuse me I've got a frog in my throat today but the the thing that i've gained most from training the way that i do is it's not as black and white as you've just described and i think the black and white nature of the way that you approach things in my mind makes it easier to label one thing a success or a failure which means that the inner voice the inner critic can be much more intense one direction or the other because we we both know that the photo shoot shape, the photo shoot shape you were in isn't going to stay for, for very long because it'll be unsustainable and equally your bad day your bad week where you might have a terrible round of the golf course and think oh i'm gonna i'm gonna it just sack my diet off today that, that that might then spiral a little bit and then that bad couple of days that doesn't define who you are but the black and white element of it means that a couple of days off the control you can very quickly have a bit of an identity crisis and i think that's why from a from a personal point of view it was healthy that i moved away from that as a metric system and again the variables that go with things like the Keltman means that even when things don't go to plan, I can objectively look at the situation that I was in and just assess, did I do what I could to put myself in that position and then control the things that I could? And what it has done 
is really forced me to confront my own ego and that's carried over into other elements of my day-to-day life so my question back to you would be is there an ego attached to what you do do you acknowledge one is it a is it a masculine thing is it something that gives you confidence does that carry over into other elements of your life because a lot of people are drawn to the gym in the first place because of those things but you say yourself you've been lifting for 13 14 years and you approach it in a similar way to how you always have done so i'm interested to know how that underpins your day-to-day character and then more importantly beyond that how that manifests in your day-to-day career yeah this feels like a therapy session now and i'm really liking it i uh, i completely acknowledge that understanding like what my drivers are for how i behave the way i behave is vitally important and i was never i was never that willing to self-explore until probably the last couple of years probably my own podcast has helped with that some of the things i've done around journaling have definitely helped with that and those traditionally might not be seen as masculine traits but a lot of how i live my life is quite traditionally masculine i think you and i have spoken of this before um i think in terms of understanding what my why is for training the way that i train yes i get a massive amount of confidence from the fact that I place value in like my adherence to a plan and I feel good about ticking those boxes and, and controlling the things that you can control. I definitely get value from looking a particular way while acknowledging that, of course, that the photo shape shape that you bring is not maintainable in any shape or form. I actually am quite fortunate, um, in some ways fortunate, but also through hard work and dedication that I can hold a pretty lean physique year round even like my bulking physique some people are like oh mate like you're you look so lean but it's all relative isn't it in terms of after such a long time training i hold a good amount of muscle mass so when there's a little bit more fat on it i still look fairly muscular and i think there is an element of identity being i'm colin and i train hard i'm in shape um, i'm into my fitness i control my nutrition but with like years and years of discipline has come a lot of freedom and because of that I have relative caloric freedom now when I'm maintaining my physique or when I'm pushing my weight up. I have to eat so much food. It's it's like inhumane. Like I think I was maintaining on like three and a half thousand calories, which for somebody that's like 75, 76 kilos is absolutely wild. So from years of adherence to the plan, I have bought greater freedom down the line. And of course, I think you you said the, the word ego. There is relative ego attached to that, but I like to think that I'm very confident and attached and uh, feel positive about areas of my competence. So like things that I'm relatively good at for uh, in terms of my expectations of myself, I have confidence and I hold myself up to a high standard in that. Things that where I'm not so good at, and again, this, we'll probably come on to this when we talk about the podcast, I am so willing to be a student. So when I listen to you talk about some of the performance events you do, some of the heavy lifts that you do, I am completely open to being like, Fergus, tell me how that works. Tell me your experience. I'll take it on board. I'll listen. But when it's on like topics that I'm very well versed on, unless somebody is coming with like greater experience or more data to like help me understand it more, I'm quite. I can be a little bit fixed from that perspective. It's it's fascinating, and I'm going to play devil's advocate. I feel like I'm somewhat attacking myself here. So this is interesting, in a in a sort of therapy session, Uno reverse style. But devil's advocate, you are from Scotland. Scotland has a lot of personality traits that the rest of the world makes fun of. We both know them. We both might love them. We both hate them. You're 29. Another element of this control has been sobriety for a long period of time recently. I know you've recently moved away from that for one evening, but we'll come on to that from your perspective. What have you missed out on? People people out there will think you've missed out on certain elements of normal day-to-day life. There's things that you've sacrificed that other people wouldn't sacrifice. There's things that people will judge you for having missed out on willingly and they won't understand the way that you approach things do you have any empathy with the way that they feel do you understand the way that they feel is there a total breakdown where you are fixed in the belief that the way you live your life is the best way to live your life at the age that you are and the process you've been on yeah that's that's an incredibly insightful direction for us to go in i am somebody that's very very happy um i've done quite a lot of personality tests through work i've done the disc personality test which is based on carl Jung's four color system um i've actually also interviewed thomas erickson who's the author of a book called surrender by idiots based on that system as well and i've also done more recently the myers briggs and then also jordan peterson's understand me so i i have really delved into like how i'm wired and i'm somebody that is extremely low in volatility 
extremely new in neuroticism and I'm quite level in terms of like my happiness and my feelings and living a life where I am like quite content with the things that I'm doing would surprise some people and some people be like, oh Colin, like is there not more to it for example? But I do loads of things that I really, really enjoy. I just do them all the time. So training, golf, socialising with friends, uh, going walks, podcasting, um, my career in terms of sales and business development and closing deals and having new conversations. I love all these things. Um, I look, Many people that follow me on Instagram will know I'm an absolutely massive Rangers fan and that fall was a big, uh, forms a big part of my, my, my week as well during the football season. But I, I like the idea of going narrow and deep on a number of different areas and I get a lot of fulfillment from that. Do I think I'm missing out on some things? So the last, uh, you mentioned I had a drink at the end of the 12 week peak, the kind of big after party we had for that. Before that I hadn't drank for two and a half years since my birthday in 2019. But importantly, a lot of people don't know before that, I probably was drinking four or five times a year. So I already had an extremely selective relationship with alcohol. And a lot of the events that I was going to, like say we were watching football on, or, or the Six Nations on a Saturday, I would go and I would drive, even back in the day where I wasn't electively sober for a, a, a sustained period. I've always been in my friend group, no one kind of is turning up and not not maybe partaking in the pints. And my happiness from the event is much more than the substances that I have during that. I think there's a lot to be said for my kind of extroverted personality type during that though. Like I can go and be heavily involved in the conversation and outgoing and very settled without the, necess- the the kind of need for a social lubricant. I've never really found it to be that important for me. And equally, when I drank the other week, I was probably just a slightly louder, slightly more uh, extroverted version of my already extroverted self. I-, I wonder if I've answered some of the question there, but not all of it, Fergus, so please please nail me on that. No, no, you have I, th- I think it's... Um, do, do, you, do you have an understanding of the, the, the criticism that that will be directed at you and has been directed at myself? And I, I often try and calibrate myself on because it's a, it's a case of there will be a stage where you can no longer look back and think, oh, I wish I'd done things differently. And I think that's that's one of the the calibration points that I'm always trying to reflect on day to day is, did I say yes to the right things? Did I say no to the, the, the wrong things, vice versa, and, and sort of reflect on those on, in terms of what I do next? Yeah, th- thanks for bringing me back to that. Um, I think I, I answered that partly by saying that I am an extremely happy person overall. So I don't have regrets day to day. Um, I mentioned I started journaling probably about two and a half years ago now, right at the kind of start of the first COVID lockdown. Um, I felt the need to like put my thoughts on paper. I'd actually just gone through a breakup as well. I'd, I'd broken up with somebody, and I didn't. I I was actually having conversations with myself that am I too like unyielding or un, un, or unwilling on particular things, and like am I setting a standard that's unfair for somebody to be involved with, um, and putting those thoughts down on paper and improving my self-talk and improving my ability to empathise and do good deeds for others as well was a, was a big part of what I've been doing with the um, the, the, the journaling work. So I, I think with the journal, you're checking in with yourself so frequently, but also you're having like times where you're doing like weekly or monthly reviews and beyond that, I'm doing like kind of quarterly or um, annual reviews. I am giving myself the opportunity to change and do things differently if things moved at a particular time um i do know that when i like the for example the last girl i dated was very open to like experience and a lot more spontaneous than me and when i was experiencing that with her politely you don't strike me as a very spontaneous person (laughs) exactly yeah exactly you 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 you, you're exactly right though fergus anyone that follows me or has regular conversations with me would know that i'm not massively spontaneous but having that element within my life was actually quite interesting and while it didn't turn into me being like super spontaneous. It meant that my Saturdays, we kind of almost like we kind of met at a midway point where the Saturdays were a bit more spontaneous for the for for me, and she knew that her kind of day with me was going to be the Saturday, and there was quite quite a healthy way for for me to introduce a bit more spontaneity where I didn't exactly know what was going to go down on the Saturday afternoon, the Saturday evening, but I knew it was going to be at that particular time and that particular day, which kind of worked okay in my in my rigid head. Compromise, compromise. I, I, I think the main the main thing here is that if you're sure of your your approach to things, then going against the groove is is definitely the right way to go. Even though the majority 
of others might not necessarily understand it. I mean, even I, to hold my hands up, I don't, I don't understand the why and the draw to physique-based goals. I, I'm much more drawn to performance goals, but I also understand that people will be like, what on earth are you doing running an ultra? Why have you ran from Glasgow to Edinburgh? But as soon as I can acknowledge that and you just enjoy things for what they are for you, there's freedom that comes with that. So with that in mind, you've covered an awful lot of the fitness side, the the passionate side outside of the vast majority of what you do on a day-to-day basis, which is your job. And your job let, let, let's let's call your your white collar career i think it's fair to say yep is is let's use it as a representative of the challenges that everybody in a similar position whether it's in sales whether it's in certain elements of, of this this sort of corporate structure that we have within the uk i think there's an awful lot that other people are going to be able to take away from the way that you approach things and the habits that you use to to lay the foundation beneath this so Talk us through what you do, what what the what the sort of KPIs are, what gives you the drive to do what you do, and just a little bit of the context on how you're in the position that you're in and why why you're in the position that you're in from a career point of view. Because I think setting that scene would be very useful so that people can understand it from their perspective. Of course. From leaving university, I studied politics at the University of Glasgow, which, as we discussed when you came on my podcast, is one of those subjects where you pretty much just demonstrate that I'm quite clever, I can write long essays, I can take lots of information and distill it down. I was doing a little bit of presenting at that point as well, which is linked into this kind of hybrid life that I lead now. And I went into the insurance industry, primarily in uh, an account management, business development sales role. And I pretty much have stayed in business development and sales throughout my career. The first seven of them in the insurance industry and then last year I moved into the furniture space but selling into an industry student accommodation that I'd arranged insurance for for a number of years so I know the industry and the contacts and the institutions and the the companies really really well I just decided to move to a different product that one financially had more scope for me to be involved in bigger deals bigger um, opportunities and, and fiscally rewarded for that but also one of the kind of key components of me finding fulfillment within my career is the is the f word fulfillment but also like purpose and within that i moved into a a large business that has a, a, a huge number of different areas that it sells into and the student division of that business was underperforming and the md that um brought me to this business i used to work with him in my first job after university and he knew that i liked to be involved in things that were not up against it but things that were being pushed to their limit in terms of we need to grow and um, we need to do x number of percentage point growth we need to increase the number of active customers we've got and these are all terms that some sales people will be familiar with but other people in corporate world are maybe aren't quite as wired this way but i loved the opportunity to go across to a company that was kind of like coasting and bring my energy and my passion and my ability to start more conversations with new customers to sign new deals to grow the business and effectively we were tasked with growing the business in the first year I was there by 132 percent and that that like gets me out of bed in the morning in terms of like I feel like I'm part of something that is important and I do think in the corporate world it's difficult to find that but when you do find it 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 can push you on and you can feel like engaged in that so I felt engaged in that I could visibly see the people that I was speaking to, the quotes I was doing, the deals I was signing, the income that was coming in, in my name and in the division's name, were directly kind of the result of my actions. Again, it links back to that fitness piece where I'm telling you, like, if I tick my calorie boxes, if I tick my training boxes, if I tick my sleep boxes, my steps, whatever else other variables want to talk about, guess what? Wow, the results are going to be good and it's going to be something that feels fantastic and there's like a positive feedback loop I, I definitely respond really well to being remunerated and rewarded off the back of efforts that i have relative control over would you have the same feeling get out getting out of bed every morning if you were flogging triple a batteries with the same kpis with the same growth opportunity would the does the product matter or is it purely the challenge and the process that you're drawn to that's a great question um I had opportunities to go into like software jobs, I had opportunities to go into um, like hardware, so not, not, not furniture. So the product does matter to an extent because I think you need product knowledge and also belief in what you're 
selling as well. So student accommodation is a crazy, crazy market in the UK now. The standard of it's just gone up and up and up. So the stuff that we put into these accommodations is actually generally nice. Like so much so that there's items of it in my own flat that I live in with, with, with my brother because be, because I was like, right, okay, well that looks great. And I think you do need to care relatively and also have like a connection with what you're selling. But equally, I worked in insurance for seven years. It's not tangible at all. It's a piece of paper that says you are covered and protected in the event of X, Y, and Z. So it's very hard to like look, touch and feel that. So it's been interesting working in a, a sector where I can look, touch and feel and go and see and take photos of the, the product that I put in. If it was AAA batteries, I wonder what that would look like. Like, could I buy into the fact that my customers are benefiting from the access to the power. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I could. It's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not something I've thought particularly much about, but if you were working maybe for the best supplier in that space or you were working for a division like, like, like I've gone to where it's kind of underperforming, like a bit underperforming, sorry, a bit of a sleeping giant and you're going to be part of the growth journey to take it forward, that might, that might outweigh the fact that I'm not massively that excited about uh, the batteries. It, it's fascinating because... From a personal point of view, I've never been able to compute that excitement within somebody else's blueprint, if that makes sense. So 132% growth only sounds exciting to me if I'm steering the ship. And I don't know whether that's a, a control thing, whether there's an element of narcissism in there. I'm sure we could unpack this in detail, but I've always been drawn to the entrepreneurial side of things from the second I've had any concept of... I think, to be honest, it was it was the metric of actually working hard for my exams and understanding that there was a, an input, the output sort of reward, ex currency exchange going on there. I think that's yeah. what made me realise actually you are in control of of certain things, and, and I've never I've never been drawn to the idea of, of working within those channels. So it's fascinating to me that you are you are the flip side, even though I share a lot of the elements of control in my personal life that underpin. The, other, the otherwise chaos as it is at the moment. Yeah. So there's two sides to what you do. Do you ever think you'd rather do the podcasting and the fitness full-time or would, you, would your life cease to be as fulfilling if it didn't have that additional demand, that higher-paced environment, the challenge of going and meeting somebody new and trying to flog them furniture when they don't even know who you are? Yeah. Are they are they synergistic or or is that, have there been moments where you think I'd rather do one over the other? Do you know what? It's... It for such a long time it was so unlikely that I would ever go full-time with something like the podcast I actually think I would never have gone full-time if I was just doing Instagram because I, I quite simply didn't get the gratification from it and I wasn't and like the sector of Instagram that I kind of grew my page in was very much super fitness based and I know that I'm not somebody that would only want to um like work with somebody on a, on a kind of fitness basis and um, what you do would be much more interesting for me but even then I don't think I would want to coach somebody like from from like a, a, a physical perspective um in terms of further performance I, I think I would be more inclined to like if I was going to coach somebody for like maybe it would be like productivity mindset habits fitness would play a big role within that but there would be like more kind of um like a kind of peak performer um, element to what I would want to do um, but the podcast occasionally I have like a Friday off or whatever when I'll interview a guest I'll go to a gym I'll create content and you'll be like wow wouldn't it be quite cool if I did this full time wouldn't it like it'd be quite fun but I guess I've never done it for like days or weeks on end where I could make like a a fair judgment and I suppose as the podcast is growing and hit some of the milestones it has in the last two years there's always the thing in the back of your head like oh wow like wouldn't it be really cool to go all in on this but because I've never spent consistent days and weeks working on it I th it'd be a very very unfair thing for me to be like because at the moment I kind of do it in my spare time I do it when I've got not, not not that I have very much spare time as you probably know Fergus but it it's very hard to know whether it would be something you'd want to tip into and I think you mentioned there the fast-paced kind of high energy pressure environment that I, that I live in and work missing that would be something interesting but then you could I think you could create that if you worked for yourself so if I put myself under like pressure to write my ebook by a particular time or write a course by a particular time or up my upload frequency from one or two a week to three a week like could you imagine the process that would be involved in that so I'd have to research more guests each day I'd, like you could fill your day 
super quickly. Look, look how heavy it is for you, and you've been doing one a fortnight. Like, could like once you go to weekly, like goodness me, it's going to be heavier. It's it's pressure with security currently though, and I think pressure without security, from my experience, is a totally different ball game as well because it makes it. I I flap more now, not flap, but I feel like I'm tail spinning. I'm good yeah. at bringing it back under control, but that snap emotion, I feel that more and more often these days than I have done previously because I think there's so much that rests on my shoulders to be able to move forwards. It's just little things like I'm not in the position to be able to go on holiday. Not currently. That that can't happen. So that's something that needs yeah. to change. But then thinking, right, let's find a let's find a route towards that. But there's work, there's time, there's commitment, there's structures that need change to be able to get there. And that in and of itself is pressure because you're like, well, I'm trapped. I'm trapped in a jail that I've built around myself, which can often feel quite quite crushing, but also quite empowering in the sense that if you built it around yourself, you've got to try and unbuild it or, or, or build the key, whatever whatever analogy you want to go in this direction with. But I think the the elements of pressure and control balance that you've got makes perfect sense. So the fact that you can be happy in that environment, I think is absolutely fantastic because I think it means that if you went, for example, training, training for me is a great example. I recently, only recently came to the, came to the realization that training for me was no longer my peaceful nature time where I got to enjoy just training for training's sake. It's part of my job. So my long four, five, six hour brick sessions on a Saturday, that's working time. So not making time to then switch off on a Sunday, for example, not making time to just go and sit around and do nothing, where I didn't need to previously because I had the training to allow me to switch off, means that I've had to reassess how I spend time in the green where it's low energy, low demand, and I can actually just reflect on nothingness for a for a moment or two, which sounds very, very dreary, that, but that's not... That's, no, that, that's, powerful. that's powerful because your escape or like switch off period was the break session on Saturday because it was such a long period. But now you have to think about filming it, pushing yourself to your limit in order to make sure that you're progressing so that you do better in your next competition or your next challenge, whatever it is you take on. So it's become more of a, a work activity than it is a, a stress release. And then I need to find a way to release the stress elsewhere, which is which is a whole other problem-solving activity in, in and of itself. So fascinating thing for me is, is, is hearing that you are completely content with the podcast being as is alongside the career because for me whenever i was developing anything in, along alongside the ambition was always to scale it to the point where i could make the switch and i think that inherently made me enjoy my day to day at work less and inherently made me put more pressure on myself which was probably a good thing at that stage to scale the other stuff but now that the the switch has flipped it, it's a case of the, the pressure environment that i've created for myself is very fulfilling very rewarding but sometimes can be very overwhelming, which is which is the reality. So, so from a personal point of view, it's fantastic to hear that you can be content with those two pillars, and as you said, yeah. be very happy because it means that you can give your best in both both versions of yourself. And I think this really neatly ties into one of the sort of big FAQs that I get from a training perspective: is people are very keen to develop and push themselves, but I work a nine to five job. I've got a kid. I've got this. I've got that. I play five aside on the Wednesday. I've got these commitments. How do people make it work? How do people find the fulfillment that you found from podcasting, from fitness, to be able to make make the time around a demanding corporate job with lots of travel, with lots of meals out, with lots of obstacles like you've got? Tell the people what they need to do, Cole. Yeah, I think just very quickly to bookmark the, the running alongside each other conversation, one of the pillars that I have when it comes to making decisions is like impact. So having an impact within that division that I moved across to to grow was really important. The impact as the podcast has grown has made it more of a contender for my corporate career. So I think it's important that I say that because there might be a point in the future where if the impact and the fulfillment and the purpose of that tipped over, then that would have a significant bearing for me. And the impact might even be it gets x number of thousand listeners more where it means that financially the podcast is a viable thing as well and it gives me so much like return in terms of like how i feel about how i'm helping people that you'd be like okay well actually i need to go and move into that so that's like the kind of last thing that i had in my head that i needed to say when it came to like the two pillars that run alongside each other there is there is obviously at some point potentially a tipping point where you'd be like shit this is a behemoth that i'm limiting and i'm limiting it 
because I'm comfortable and I don't I, I like I like the growth zone. That's why I moved into a new industry after seven years to go and try and grow it. But onto the more onto the more uh, more, more pressing matter in terms of how people do things um, alongside a busy career and, and still maintain their fitness. Um, knowing your why is important. So finding whether it is going to be aesthetic based, whether it's going to be performance based, whether it's going to be a team sport. Doing something you enjoy is vitally important. Like if you see a photo of me on Instagram doing bicep curls and you think, oh, Cole's biceps look great, I'm going to go and train like that, that's probably not enough. If you see Fergus tearing around on YouTube on his on his bike or running this absolutely insane length of uh, length of miles and you think, that looks cool, that's probably not going to be enough for you to make it a priority when you're really tired on a Wednesday night because you've just had uh, a, a, a 10 hour day in the office you've just been bollocked off your boss because you guys missed missed a deadline or something important you're probably not going to drag yourself and do the type of training that you might need to do to achieve those types of goals so understanding like what actually would give you a good a good positive feedback loop in terms of your style of training is vitally important um much like you would do with your work diary i hope you would anyway when you have meetings they're in your outlook calendar they're in your Slack calendar, whatever it, software it is you use in your work, make your training non-negotiable within your calendar as well. That may sound something that's really anal, and you've listened to some of the things that Ferguson and I've delved into about how I like to set my life up. But stealing elements of the way that somebody like the way I'm wired is very, very helpful. So I, I spoke to Jordan Syatt on the podcast, and he's well known as being the guy that coached Gary V, who. Anyone that knows Gary Vaynerchuk knows that he's like one of the busiest men in the world. Men in the world, and he never used to train, never used to look after himself. But basically, he was diarizing in his calendar when he's training and when he's eating as well, because everything was back to back. So when he put those in, they became non-negotiables. So you, as a, a busy corporate worker, if you've got family commitments or anything else outside of that, knowing that there is a window at six a.m. to seven a.m. or 5:30 p.m. till 6:30 p.m. when you absolutely must train legs on a on a Monday night, that's going to have to happen. So putting it in your diary and making it a non-negotiable and having it in writing, there is a little bit of a commitment there that works well with your 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 head and blocking it at that time is vitally important because it comes very very important. Planning ahead in tr- in training regards, but I also mentioned there about how uh, Gary was putting in like time to eat his food, but also knowing roughly what you're going to eat. I'm not going to tell you to track every calorie or every gram of my fitness pal or even follow a particular meal plan but having staple meals that you go towards for two out of the three or two out of the four or two out of the five whatever structure of meal you're eating within your day is going to make things so much easier and it's going to save you decision making bandwidth for far more important things that you do within your working day so the last thing I want to be thinking about is what I'm going to have for my breakfast on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday when Actually, what I need to be thinking about is how am I going to come back to this email and work? How am I going to schedule this podcast guest? How am I going to fit in my my training this weekend when I've got two birthday parties and a round of golf? Like, there's there's much more important things you can put yourself towards than what's going to go down my gullet. And link to that before I I, 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 I kind of go back to get your opinion on this, Fergus, because I'd love to hear it from your perspective. What you eat as well can give you a positive feedback loop. So the quality of the food is vitally important as well. I definitely fell into the the trap where if it fits your macros, bro, was massively important. And while calories are actually, when it comes to how you look, the be all and the end all in terms of body composition, what goes into your mouth also will affect how you perform and work. So if I smash a protein shake and a Snickers to hit like 400 calories, I'm not going to feel as good as if I eat something a bit more wholesome, a bit more nutritious, and my performance and work, my energy levels are going to be much more stable if I eat something that, for the same calories, gives me more nutritional value too. Entirely agree. And the way that I view things is actually, it, it, it's, it's black and white, funnily enough, which is, is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on which side of the coin you're on today. But I either have enough micronutrition and I feel great, or I don't and I don't is the way that I view things and I can feel when I'm one side or the other and I can easily fix it that's within my control but for me from a nutritional point of view access is a big thing in terms of making sure that your food shop is actually the first step of the process in terms of the decisions you make for the rest of the week obviously more difficult if people have children because turkey dinosaurs need to be stocked you need to have penguin bars if they're even still a thing I don't know other than just a publisher but having that stuff in the house for example if there's digestion in the house 
there was a time in my life where I just didn't eat digestives because that didn't fit into my category of food that can or cannot be eaten. But now, I've got into the habit recently of, of I'll have three or four digestives with a cup of caffeine-free tea before bed and then I'll put them in my calorie quota for the following day to sort of balance the books. I have a very healthy relationship with my calorie tracking. That's not an obsessive thing. It's just a pure, it's a pure P&L sheet in terms of calorie equation. But I'm like, you didn't enjoy... There was no merit to, to that. All you've done is borrow food from tomorrow, you moron. And then I do the, the same thing the following night. And interestingly, going back to the time blocking and the diarising side of things, I actually had this conversation with Erin yesterday. Swimming is a pain in the ass for me because I live half an hour away from the pool that I'm a member at. I'm, I'm a member at Nuffields. So there's three that I can swim at in Edinburgh. One of them's kind of a health club, so actually swimming lengths and doing sessions is kind of off the table. One of mm. them's reasonable, but occasionally has kids in it like... 5 p.m. ish um so that sort of hour either side of that's not great and then the other one i can walk through from the office but if there if i'm working from home and i've got a swim session i need to drive an hour in total plus the swim and it makes there's so much friction between me doing that even if it's in the diary that stops me from doing it so what i've started doing when i know i'm doing swims on days where i'm not already in edinburgh is booking a session at the commonwealth pool because if I booked it, I mean, th 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 these are geographical terms to people listening, but basically I'm booking and paying for a session at a 50 meter pool with certain time parameters because it means that I have one, paid for it, so added some skin in the game there. Two, it is a non negotiable time at which I can turn up. Even if it's, it's out with my control, I'm buying into somebody else's timetable, and it means that I just go and get the swim done. And I don't complain about it in my head. I don't think, oh, I might just do it tomorrow first thing. Rather if you don't turn up, you don't get to swim. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then I beat myself up rather than trying to rationalize it as, oh, you, yeah, you, can, but you can just swim tomorrow. It's fine. You needed the psychological break. All these, all these things that we do as human beings where we try and argue with ourselves. And I think putting stuff in the tie, putting stuff in the, this, this is why PTs are great. This is why PTs are fantastic. Because for people with busy schedules, busy lives, knowing that you're going to see Gavin, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at a certain time means that you're going to be there and that might be the incentive that you need but putting it in the diary is a great place to start if you can then look at visibility of your calendar that gives you a sense of control that can then build momentum and carry you into other things so both of those two points there I fully agree with from a sort of underpinning work-life balance point of view and annoyingly, even though I'm not within the, the 9 to 5, 8 to 6 bro I operate within those hours because I've sort of been societally conditioned to do so. So I base most of my training around those hours. When I, other I, people are in the gyms and areas and it's busier. Yeah, yeah, even though I don't necessarily need to do that. But I get to the, I get to the swimming pool at half 6 p.m. like, oh, oh no. <laughs> this is, you could have been here at 3 if you wanted to, Fergus. But no, I've got calls back to back during the day because that's when people people with sort of regular working schedules are working so i can't I really escape from that so it, it, again I, I have a lot of the same problems even though i don't necessarily work in a white collar industry I, i'm working with the same same time parameters so I can understand the, the challenges that you've got there as well one of the big things you brought up when it came to going to the swimming pool was convenience and understanding that driving 30 minutes each way when it comes to a busy schedule isn't the most convenient and I definitely think people need to consider like their choice of gym or their choice of like when they train around that as well so like there's there's some gyms in Glasgow and outside Glasgow that I would love to train at because the atmosphere would be better I'd maybe have a slightly like a, a five percent better session I'd maybe see more of like more people that create content on Instagram that I can chat with and maybe collaborate with and all that kind of stuff but I choose to train at a David Lloyd, which is about eight minutes drive from my house, sometimes there's, there's, less. There's one opening up five minutes from me in 2023 or four, which I cannot wait for. And yeah. I, I, like, I, I shouldn't be getting excited about a David Lloyd, but I am, because it means the pool within five minutes. So I, I will not discriminate. I will it's go huge. to whatever pool it's I can huge, swim yeah. in that's convenient. So I completely agree yeah, there. It, it's, it's, it's huge that people make that consideration. And... When I work, I, I, I've, I've worked in kind of two different capacities. One, I, for the first four years of my career, I was entirely work from home, going out to see clients all across the UK. For about two years, I was office-based at George Square in Glasgow with one day a week in uh, Edinburgh. And then now I'm back to being work at home and kind of covering all across the UK. And making sure that I knew where I was training on what days and like making sure that the time between me clocking out of work or clocking into work was minimal before training was absolutely vital. So like I do not want to lose 
45 minutes traveling from the office to a gym or from a meeting in wherever I am to a gym. I want to get into a gym and train as soon as possible because my willpower, although we, you probably picked up from this conversation, I have quite high levels of willpower and discipline. I, I value that. Don't test it too often. Like, make sure that it's at a minimal level. So knowing that I could come out of the office in George Square, walk around the corner, get changed, put my suit away, go straight into a gym, and I was training about like quarter past five, unbelievably good for adherence. Whereas if I had to jump on the train out of Glasgow, out to Bears Den, get in the car, go home, get changed, drive to the gym, by the time I'm at the gym, it's maybe quarter to six, six o'clock, I have tested my ability and given myself so many points where I could have dropped out and been like, you know what, Colin, like you were saying, Maybe you need the psychological break, Colin. Maybe you need the psychological break, Fergus. Take take it take it off tonight. You've given yourself quick points, whereas if you make it frictionless, and this is a big learning from James Clear, Atomic Habits, minimising the friction to adhere to your good habits is something that so, so many of us need to do. And again, pinging off my head is something you said as well when you were saying having the digestives, having the penguin biscuits, having the turkey dinosaurs in the house, That is that is removing the friction from having a potentially bad habit if if that doesn't fit your particular nutritional goals at that period of time it, it's every, everything in essence is is simple but it, it's how do we apply the simplicity to our to our day-to-day lives which is complicated because it, it's difficult to understand where we can fit all the all these small changes in actually how we can have faith that these small changes will add up over time which I've lived through firsthand having been an overweight rugby player when I was younger who understood nutrition and then went completely anal completely borderline evangelical with the way that I approach approach things and that put me in one direction that became too controlling too rigid and then from there I found a happy balance where I can actually reflect on the situation and there will be situations for today turbo trainer I was sitting 120 watts for three minutes and I just knew I just knew my legs w- weren't there I was I was in the Pentlands this morning and I felt heavy on the way down I thought oh this will be interesting on the bike later on and from a purely performance, but also a psychological point of view, because I knew I had a 90-minute turbo trainer session scheduled three minutes into the warm-up. The lowest watts were going to be the whole day. My legs felt terrible. So physiologically, I'm getting signals that I should adjust. Psychologically, I knew it meant that I wasn't going to sit there for 90 minutes and absolutely hate life, wondering why I'm why are you performing so badly? Well, oh, you've clearly not eaten well enough. You've clearly not hydrated all these things. I'm just going to bump it tomorrow because that was the right thing to do previous version of me would have been very hard on myself saying I'd quit all these things but the the more up to date balanced version of myself can can view things with with rational thought and assess what to do next and I think that's where trial and error with all of the habits that we see online trial and error with how you can make things work around a busy family life how can you make things work around a busy work life is it a case of training first thing in the morning is it a case of trying to sneak out for half an hour at lunchtime is it a case of having a conversation with your wife and saying, look, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, these 45 minutes whilst you're cooking dinner, as you normally would do, I'm going to go for a 45-minute run. Whilst I'm not present in the house, are you happy taking control for those 45 minutes? Yes or no? If the answer is no, try and find another solution. But it's 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 trying to remove the friction points that are stopping you from doing the things that you want to achieve, where you want to make changes in your life, and seeing if they work. If they don't stick, move on to something else. But I think uh, step number one is is giving something a go and seeing what happens massive massive points and uh, one of the other areas that i've explored recently is outsourcing some of um my, my tasks so i like to have a very clean flat and my brother is very much minded that way as well and um, borderline ocd in some circumstances um and about about 13 14 months ago we outsourced to a cleaner who comes every single tuesday um, it's £15 each so £30 a week each and that probably saves about an hour and a half of our time because she cleans an awful lot better than we did and she does it in less time and uh, buying back that time has allowed me to either spend more time on my fitness more time on my podcast more time on my actual day job or even if I wanted to more time on my golf more time walking more time relaxing um, and weighing that up was super important. Alongside that was outsourcing my, my meal prep as well. Um, so I was probably cooking for about an hour and a half every Sunday and do a kind of top up on like a Thursday or a, or, or a Wednesday, depending on what kind of stuff I was cooking and what the shelf life of it was. So outsourcing that was another decision that I made from a fiscal perspective um, to buy back some of my time. And again, not everyone's in that position to do that, but 
weighing that up in terms of does that allow me to train more often does it allow me to look after my like my kind of social being more often does it allow me to work more often earn more money so that i can pay for this but also pay for other things that i care about or does it allow me to invest more money if if, if, if i do that as well buy buy more bitcoin while it's on sale on sale fergus but it's a uh, it's really interesting i previously would have had an attitude much like you were saying with like how you developed over time i'll call and save the money on that and like just do it yourself but i've become more open-minded to like if my hour can be more valuable than like the 30 pounds or however much it costs for, for, for meal prep if i can buy back that time and invest that hour or two hours or whatever i'm gaining back more wisely and like or maybe i just feel better then it might be worth the the juice might be worth the squeeze the the thing there as well it, it's going it, it, there's a lot of traditional wisdom that we've all been told there isn't there which is oh if you can clean it yourself you shouldn't be spending out on it oh you shouldn't you should keep all your money close to close to you at this point obviously this is coming from a place of if you're fortunate enough to be in the position to to have these conversations but it's it's going against the grain of of what what's normal and sort of thinking a little bit outside of the box of your individual context i think is the main thing we actually can't find a cleaner locally to us that's it's reasonable they're all very seemingly very uh very very premium services so it actually hasn't really? become it hasn't yeah there's the my, everybody i know has always had a, a sort of just a one brenda or a one this person or that person that just comes and does it but we haven't been able to find one it's all agency with we'll send a team of nine around well we don't want a team of nine oh, God. <laughs> i don't want to spend 900 quid a month on cleaning i think I'll, I'll keep keep haphazardly doing it myself but no outsourcing meal preps for me big thing um, having the gym in the house is an element of that in the sort of same principle whereby it's cutting it's out that little man. It's just being being able to walk in and get something done without thinking about it in the same way, opening the fridge and taking a meal out. And I'll, actually, from a financial point of view, if you're yoloing your food shops, the meals you're going to be cooking, when you actually add up and divide by a number of meals, are going to be very, very similar, if not more expensive for less overall quality, much more effort, much more time than were you buying from a meal prep company. And there are some fantastic ones out there now. There were it, in its early days it was there were some tenuous ones, but most of them that I've experienced now are really good. There's one that I use and, and swear by, so it's it's it, it's something that's been great for me. But I think um for anyone's individual situation it's look at look at where the friction points in are in your day to day life, whether that's work, family, fitness, isolate them attempt some try and find test a solution and if it works keep doing it if it doesn't try something else so any any clear examples of changes you've made on a day-to-day -day basis around your new work schedule since you've moved into the sales side of things where you had to reassess recalibrate and it's actually had a positive impact for you yeah i i i double up on a lot of things so um now I don't I don't I don't do a lot of the cleaning and I don't do a lot of the cooking anymore. But even when I was doing that, I was maybe listening to self development podcasts like The Modern Mind, like my podcast, like Chris Williamson, or I was listening to sales training. I was dialing into like webinars where there was coaches doing that kind of thing. So using your time when you're doing something anyway to tick off another box that you're probably gonna tick anyway. So when I go for my morning walk. And that's a bit of a keystone habit for me, like starting my day with some sort of commute, particularly when you're working at home, feeling like you've started your day. And even though we live in climes that aren't always particularly sunny, Fergus, getting some sort of fresh air at that point and, in the day and, is... And is sunlight, sunlight, most importantly, from a circadian rhythm point of view, the actual biological implications of that are enormous. Yeah, words out my mouth there. Starting that off and enabling you to be fresher and then get a better sleep at, at, at night by doing that first thing in the morning is is absolutely vital so doubling up and i don't want to feel like i'm preaching productivity over everything but being productive when you have the opportunity to be is absolutely massive and i am a bit of an evangelist when it comes to trying to manage my screen time and be conscious when i'm using my phone and it's a big thing like it's really easy to get stuck on the the Instagram reel or the TikTok um, kind of hamster wheel. But when I look to use my phone, using it in a in a meaningful way to either consume content that's really going to benefit me, to create content, which is obviously something that is not unique, but it's it's rare to content, it's exclusive to content creators. But making sure that when I am using my devices, that I'm getting some sort of bang for my buck and re and like a positive feedback loop on what, I, what I'm doing. So I guess when it comes to like how busy my career is and how busy my content creation and my kind of fitness side is, making sure that I'm very intentional with my time. I don't like to be on 
autopilot and doing things that are kind of dictated to. So, for example, controversially, I won't watch I won't watch Love Island because I know that I probably want to watch all of it, and that's an hour an hour an, an hour a night every single week or an hour on catch up all the time. Would I get an awful lot from that? No. So I'm probably more likely to spend an hour researching a podcast guest or listening to a podcast about an area of my life I want to improve on. So being quite intentional with how I spend my time enables me to have greater freedom when it comes to the weekend and I'm on top of all my content, I'm on top of all my all my day job and I can go and play a four hour round of golf or I can go out for dinner with 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 my friends for three hours and not worry that or oh, Colin you need to edit the podcast for next week. The fear that, that I saw in your eyes when you said if you watched an episode of Love Island, you'd be, you'd be hooked. How did your need for control cope with the early stages of the pandemic? Because it was a real curveball. Not just not just for people that desire control, but for everybody. But for somebody with your personality type, with our personality type, I I actually feel because of the way that I work now, I actually by default have taken that constant requirement for control a little bit out of my own hands by mistake but it's become a good thing for me but how did yep. you cope with the world turning upside down so much with all these structures that you had in place yeah you you lost a little bit of your identity so my identity at that point was Colin, the insurance broker for marsh who wore his blue suit and went out to meetings shook hands with finance directors and tried to close deals and underneath the suit was the the, the ripped guy that trains six days a week in a in a in an aircon gym with barbells and plates and loud music playing after he's tanned this white monster so to lose the op- opportunity to go out and meet people face to face and shake hands and be the face of a company that's trying to push forward and to lose the access to the gym definitely for a period your head goes in a bit of a wobble in terms of oh this is a a loss for me but I, I did mention I've got quite low levels of like volatility and neuroticism and I feel like I was able to adapt quite quickly and find new outlets for that and I started the podcast in March 2020 after threatening to do it for like nine months so I eventually was like oh well I'll I'll not pour myself fully into these other things but I'll allocate this energy that I would normally put into these things into other areas so I started training at a garage gym I actually dabbled in a bit of functional fitness for that kind of 18 months where gyms were shut on and off because the garage that I was going to was kind of equipped in a way where you had the assault bike, you had the ski erg, I was doing more Metcons. And it's it's maybe uh, interesting to note that I've gone back to the kind of more bodybuilding stuff off the back of that. I did enjoy it at the time and uh, it, it was fun, but I gravitated back to it while, of course, being I was more open-minded to doing that. But yeah, at the start of the pandemic, you were stripped of two areas of like identity that were quite big for me. So I quickly made sure that I was allocating this level of energy and buoyancy that I've got into more projects that fulfilled me. So I was still training even before I had access to the garage. I was going to the park and the pull-ups. I had a dumbbell. I had a resistance bands. I was still making sure I was ticking that box. I was still trying. I, I didn't go on. I wasn't on furlough or anything like that, which I think would have been more of a challenge for me if I'd not been, if I hadn't replaced work with, uh, virtual work, I would have been like, wow, well, that's that's harder for my head than than uh, than going from you'd be going more ze- uh, kind of one hundred to zero rather than uh, like, I don't know a hundred to eighty. Um, and then finding a way to fill the twenty with the podcast, I think is the sort of way to view it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. No, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. So, podcast has been mentioned in 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 some detail. We, we've alluded to it. There's been one hundred and thirty four episodes with a few more than that recorded i'd imagine so i'm not going to ask you to recount all 134 episodes as people can go and do that themselves but before we close off what have been the three light bulb moments that you've had from 134 episodes thus far if there have been three maybe people haven't been that insightful maybe there's too many to choose from you tell me there's probably too many to choose from and i've definitely got some elements of recency bias but number one that springs to mind is like a kind of core theme across a lot of my guests. Now, there's definitely a, not a recency bias, but there's definitely like a a selection bias based on the type of guests that I have on. It's largely a self-development podcast, but I have access to a lot of people within the fitness world. And one of the terms you used when you recorded back in May 21 was we talked about like fitness and training being like an anchor within your life. So many of my guests have raised the fact that their 
hour, two hours, whatever it is, where they put themselves in a training position is a massive fundamental that links into their success in the rest of their life as well. And I know from a personal perspective that my entry to the self-development world was physically getting in a shape where I felt more confident, I had more self-esteem, I realised that the effort that I was putting into this space, if I could apply that in my career, in my university studies, that, oh, wow, like actually, it works really well. So a huge number of my guests, from a from a selection bias perspective, but also just a general learning perspective, have said to me that fitness, training, nutrition, and like looking after their body has enabled them to pursue excellence in the different fields that they've been in, whether that's somebody like yourself, Fergus, or whether that's somebody that... Um, has excelled in in, the, in 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 other areas of business or investing or some of the other topics that I've delved into. It's been very interesting to see that so many of them have a bias towards looking after their body and ticking that box and making sure that that area of their life is on lock so that they can then apply themselves successfully in other areas. It's it's something that I often say, but often find myself almost creeping back into my turtle shell. To ah, it sounds a bit trite, but time after time chief exec after chief exec success, successful entrepreneur after successful entrepreneur there is a a theme that runs through it and it is that for everybody whether it's i mean it could be archery it could be tiddlywinks it could be painting warhammer models but i think everybody has an anchor that can really keep them stable can help them find that that psychological homeostasis that we're all looking for and for me, for you, it's training. I think for if it were everybody that there is a there is a neurochemical benefit to it that is undeniable. How far you want to take that in one direction or the other it is up to you. But I think there's there's a minimum there's a minimum dose that everybody will benefit from. So I'm a yeah that that thread of DNA is something that's ran through all the lessons that I've learned. Anything from a personal perspective that's made you really reconsider your position on something? Yeah, um, I guess. I've recently explored like um, attachment in relationships. Again, that's a big recency bias because Adam Lane Smith was recently on my podcast. He was a fantastic guest. And he spoke a lot about how... And I'd listened to him lots on podcasts before, so it wasn't completely mind-blowing, but there's elements where I was like just listening to him. So he was talking about the differences in terms of how men and women bond to one another. So men tend to bond through struggle and challenge and feeling like they've accomplished something with their partner. Whereas women bond through like oxytocin, which is like shared experience and enjoyment and like feeling support from each other. So that there, there are crossovers there, but there are very different chemicals that are going off in, in, uh, in, in men's brain. He spoke quite controversially about hookup culture. And I think as a guy coming from like a rugby background who's got a big fitness influencer uh, account, like I, I've definitely been guilty of like falling into that kind of societal programming where it is like masculine and cool to like try and be involved in the, in the in the hookup culture scene and he definitely not red pilled me but like very much like stressed the importance he was like well like there's elements of like being avoidant and like not being willing to attach that come from this so like you need to be very careful as a a man that holds himself to like high values in like lots of an area of his life make sure that you're not falling into r- bad rabbit holes in that area so i think from a personal perspective he was very enlightening when it comes to like how to be a secure person that you can find a more fulfilling relationship off off the back of that as well. And I don't think that's something that a lot of people who are like self-development focused think about. Like I know I have a lot of friends who are like very passionate about that, but I've never thought about taking the same level of like mindful, controlled, data-led, sensible approach to to, to dating. And either they're with somebody that you're kind of, oh, I'm not really sure that's compatible and they're not sure it's compatible or they're just completely single and just causing an absolute ruckus. It's funny, isn't it? Because it, because at base level you can be quite analytical with these things i think you can be quite analytical with everything but i i i tend not to say that so often because it does sound like i'm sucking the fun out of life to some degree but from my point of view i I just try and analyze each and every interaction and each and everything and try and distill it down to its base base level data and as you just said i shouldn't say this but if i was if i was hypothetically in in a dating world now living my life the way that i do now i'd be very methodical and be very analytical about it in the sense that i would nip things in the bud the second there was a an inkling of incap- incompatibility because that's that's incompatibility an inkling I, I, again there might be some examples but i'm i'm so far out the game i wouldn't be able to tell you i think is is where i'm going with this but it's more a case if you, you can analyze you can analyze the outputs that come from everything that you're doing in your day-to-day life 
and make decisions as a result of those and there are a few things in society like dating like fulfillment at work like family relationships like how to act in certain situations like what direction you should go academically all these things that are done a certain way so we're inherently hardwired to think no i can't reflect on these in a new and innovative way for me as an as an individual so i think uh yeah the 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 element there of holding yourself to standards in one thing make sure you're holding yourself to those standards across the board rather than letting society tell you to do things a different way is the, is the, the yeah. short-term lesson i've taken from that just then you see you see people say like how you do one thing's how you do everything and i think that's that that that's fair sometimes there needs to be things where like there's elements of fun so i i said during this discussion that like one of the elements of fun within my week and my time is like my golf which albeit i am a, a reasonable golfer i've got a good handicap I'm not brilliant and there's days where I just tear my hair out but it's it's just fun like I don't I say I tear my hair out I'm a bit frustrated but I forget about it almost instantly say like it's important to have elements within your day-to-day where you don't think take, take things too seriously but in terms of like relationships and like even friendships being aware of like how beneficial and supportive they are for you as an overall and taking like quite a, a measured approach to them is is pretty important and um, the the other kind of third lesson that stands out I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention something financial and I've had some incredible conversations with different investors different people who are interested in different asset types whether that's property stocks and shares cryptocurrency even forex that has been massive for me because I thought I was quite financially literate two and a half years ago when I started the podcast but now having exposed myself to some of the, the kind of sharpest minds in that space and really delved into those topics Again, I'm very calm and measured about my kind of longer term approach for it. Well, of course, it's easy to get caught on the kind of short term hypes and the waves of the different things. I've been able to share good level like educational content, not financial advice, on uh, on on some massively important topics because I think again, for the type of audience that would listen to this kind of podcast, Vegas and my podcast, you're quite focused on like pursuing your best versions. But making sure that you're kind of looking after the background when it comes to the finances is something that so many of us actually forget about. And some of the stats around the amount that people in the in the UK have saved and for a rainy day, particularly as we're coming into what could potentially be quite a turbulent financial period, is quite alarming. So the more that people in my age demographic who have my audience demographic are talking about financial literacy and um not saving for a rainy day but investing for a rainy day and providing yourself with the funds that you could react to an emergency or or making sure that you've got exposure to a few different asset classes so that you're protected from jumping on all aboard the crypto train or all aboard the all aboard the the the, the game stock and um, where people were, were flipping stocks all these kind of crazy hypes that uh, people get involved in sharing responsible content in that space has been something that from a personal level i benefited from i'm also very proud of as well and i've started conversations with people in my dms where they've been like I'm so glad you had Andrew Craig in your podcast. I'm so glad you spoke to Crypto Glasgow because I just didn't understand this stuff before. I consider myself to be like successful in my career, but I had no savings, no investments, no emergency fund for if, if my if my boiler broke next month, I was living paycheck to paycheck, but I'm earning a good salary. So that's been like one of my favorite parts of the kind of 134 episodes so far, having a financial element to it where people can explore that topic. Interestingly, it's not an area that I'm that well versed in. Well, not to the level that you are, but something Nick McGooley said on, I can't remember what podcast it was on, it might have just be an Instagram post, but I, I'm i in the camp of I won't be able to save at a rate quick enough to outstrip the incentive to just try and earn more. However, the challenge I have is is setting certain baselines and then sticking to them and then setting certain thick fixed amounts per month is where I've been poor and continue to be poor. So from a personal point of view, that's something that I need to get better at. But I think, uh, as you said, splitting across multiple assets and multiple sort of elements there. So you're not all, all eggs in one basket as it were. But I think also trying to explore any ways in which you can develop secondary income, any ways in which you can try to try to tie yourself to something else, even if it's purely from a hobbyist point of view to start with. Developing yourself might be something that you might enjoy, and then it might accidentally become something that can earn you money. And the more you can spread, spreading risk is the way that I view it. <laughs> whilst it comes I love with, that. Whilst it comes with infinite stress at my end now, spreading things across multiple multiple different spaces, 
it means that if one of the industries that I operate within completely collapsed, then I would have other things that I could fall back on. And the collapse of said industry means that I would free up a lot of my time to then go and index on those things. So whilst I'm at the mercy of the security of the markets in which I operate, I'm much more confident, feel much more safe in that position that I'm not, all, all my eggs are not in one basket of being Fergus Crawley, the YouTube fitness guy, because I have relationships with corporates and contracts with corporates to go in and speak and provide speakers over a 12 month period. I then also have the relationship with the coaching side of things, which yes, is tied in with the YouTube stuff. But from my point of view, my investments, this is just a pure a reflection and actually just considering my own lack of knowledge from your point of view, given the people who've had it on your podcast is I'm trying to um, scale and develop across different industries for the future rather than necessarily looking at the money in certain investment accounts. So it's almost yeah. ha- it's almost having blind faith in myself to make that happen. But with that comes the fear that what if I'm wrong? <laughs> I think I think I think you're doing something that's vitally important. And yeah, spoiler alert, Nick McGilley will come out of my podcast at the end of July. He was absolutely brilliant. Um, and yeah, Nick Magilli is an absolute savage and he is so right because if you shop around for the best possible investment, you might get a 10% return. And like, I think we were saying like, if for example, you're somebody that's fortunate enough to be investing 500 pounds a month, that's six grand a year. If you get 10% on that, that's 600 quid. You could earn 600 quid with a side hustle. No problem at all across a year. Like you, you, you could, could, you could that do month. two twelve-hour shifts at your mate's bar over the weekend if you paid you a little bit more, and you'd you'd, you'd be done. This is something that I, uh, yeah, I constantly reflect on because it's a case of it's a case of how, how, but how can how can we find ways to to beat that investment curve, um, but then more importantly turn that beating the investment curve into valuable investments with that ten percent. Because it, it, investments don't seem until you've got a hundred grand in the bank, where you're like, right, ten percent's ten grand. It's very difficult to think this is worth doing, isn't it? Yeah, you, you, you're you're so right. And like, I've probably been investing since twenty eighteen, so I've started to see it compound. And up until probably the Ukraine Russia war, I was like fifteen twenty percent up on those investments. And when you're putting in a good sum each month, I was like, right, okay, I'm really starting to move the dial now because seeing. 5, 10, 15%, 20% on those numbers, I was like, okay, great. And I knew I was just loading in on top and I viewed these years as like a wealth accumulation phase rather than necessarily like being able to look at that amount and be like, wow, like think of what I could do with that. It was like, don't worry about it, put it away. Like just know that in 2050 or 2040, whenever I want to maybe access that, there's going to be a sum there that's going to make me very comfortable financially. Um, But the most when, important when, thing... When, is when, will, when will that time be? Will there be a time that you can look at an investment account and you can think, I'm going to empty that? I know you're not going to empty it, but for, for sake of argument, do you think the way that your personality operates, you will ever be willing to take a step back from that growth? Do you ever want to see that number go down? I'd like to be financially free by the time I'm 40. And by financially free, I mean that would be able to not work every single day if you needed to. So that would be like, if I wanted to, I could just go full time with like blogging and podcasting or whatever else. Um, even if it didn't return like equivalent to my salary. But you wouldn't, basically you would need to be in a position where the return on your investments in terms of like the the 10, the 20, whatever percentage you were managing to get from the market, normally it's much lower than that, it's probably about 6% if you're you're doing quite well. If you've got that 6% on top of that, that is basically paying your salary, which is a, it's an unusual thing to think about. So say for example, the the 10% on 400 grand was paying you 40 grand and that was what your salary was at this point in time, then you'd be in a position where you'd be like, well, actually, I'm, I am financially free because I'm covering all my expenses with my investment growth and if worst comes to worst, I would liquidate some of my assets to cover my expenses. Do I think my personality type would allow that? I think with the literature that I've read and the people that I've spoken to, I think I would be more comfortable because I'm kind of, um, if I was to tell you about the kind of colours, I'm red, which is like decisive, um full steam ahead let's work but i'm quite blue which is like data driven analytical driven so i can be swayed on like the action that i'm taking if the data compels me to do it and if i have a conversation with somebody i respect like you ferguson you said colin like i've been thinking about this particular thing that you've been up to like have you ever thought about doing it this way and i'm like oh well i'm open to that ferguson you tell me how that works and if you give me data and facts and statistics that convince me of it i'd probably end up in a position where i'd be like okay i'm gonna take action on what ferguson has said and like of course, with some other sources as well to kind of back that up. So I do think that if the time came, I hit 40, which is 11 years time, and I had, say, between 
half a million to a million pounds. It depends what your risk and tolerance is. You might be in a position where you're like, actually, I, I could I could walk away from every job that I do and just do passion projects that earned whatever. I think I, I think I could potentially talk myself into doing that. Interesting, interesting. I am conscious that we could talk for nine and a half more hours about a whole variety of things, as that is the nature of of having having fascinating conversations with fascinating people like yourself. So, for fascinating people that are listening to to find more about everything that we've discussed and lots of informative podcast episodes on some of the things that we've touched upon some things we've touched on in more depth and we're probably at risk of just going into full conversation mode forgetting that we're recording at this point but where can people find you thanks fergus yeah the place ahead will be instagram which is call.cambrell i'm also on linkedin which is colin t campbell and the podcast is wherever you're listening to this you can find it at cambrell conversations and please let me know that you heard me on this one and you enjoyed it Thank you very much and sleep well as it's a late finish.